been 51 years since BMW's M Division was first founded back in 1972 and it's built a lot of exciting machinery in the last half century. But few of its illustrious road cars have been quite as significant a landmark as this new XM. And there are plenty of reasons why. Unlike any M car of the last few decades that have been enhanced BMW models, the XM is a standalone model fully developed by the M Skunk Works. And it's only the second one in history behind 1978's M1 Supercar. It's the first M car in history to be electrified, and given that it shoehorns a twin turbo V8 under the bonnet, is the first hybrid M car of any description. 480 kilowatts, 800 newton meters, and 4.3 seconds 0 to 100 are all stats that really befit a landmark M car, but there's more. BMW will also offer a spicier label red version with its own benchmarking claim to fame, but more on that later. A different approach to styling, newfound motivation, and a bit of a twist in the interior, there's an awful lot to unpack on this new XM. And that includes whether or not it was a wise idea to make such a landmark car an SUV. But let's start with the most conspicuous new frontier, exterior styling. Chasing cars, honest reviews of your next car. Brought to you by Budget Direct. Let's address the elephant in the room. The XM is not a machine for owners who are shrinking violets. In the flesh, it's angular, aggressive, and almost confrontational, and nowhere more so than in the front end. Like it or loathe it, BMW's kidney grills are getting larger and larger, and its headlights, or to be more accurate, its driving lights, are getting slimmer and squintier. And I do imagine that if you were hogging the right-hand lane and an XM was bearing down in your wing mirrors, it would look a bit like a charging rhinoceros. And part of that's because there's a lot of it. It's over 5.1 metres long and over 2 metres wide, but it has a low roof line that's just 1.7 metres, which really does add a sinister look that BMW M is obviously gunning for. The stretch proportions, the power dome bonnet, and the pump rear guards really all add a lot of drama. While the chiseled surfaces, the spheroid wheel arches, the 23-inch wheels, and gold detailing all contribute to the sheer ostentation of the thing. BMW calls it coupe style, but really, by car design convention, it is a wagon because the tail slopes from the D-pillar. There are plenty of neat details too, such as the glowing light surrounds of the kidney grille, the laser-etched BMW logos on the rear windows, the fancy gold diffuser, and these stacked hexagonal tailpipes. <laughs> Whether you think it's handsome or not, the XM appearance does befit a vehicle costing $302,200 list or around $320 grand drive away. So let's see if the interior can live up to the promises made by the charismatic exterior. Right, there's an awful lot going on in the cabin, but before we deal with any of this stuff, what is that? I'll tell you what that is, it's vintage leather in coffee brown colour. I've never seen this before in any car and it's a first for BMW and it's so utterly lovely that I wonder why it's taken motoring around 140 years to put it into a vehicle. Sorry, okay, now the rest of the cabin. For a start, it's quite lush in here and this whole two-tone split level theme is really quite fetching. Much of the effect is a combination of this really fetching vintage leather combined with the seat trim, which is a merino leather. But you also get suede like Alcantara for the headlining. It bisects the dash and it continues on through these really lovely door cards. It does bring a heightened sense of occasion and a really unique flavor to the XM's interior experience. Speaking of uniqueness, forget about just mere mood lighting strips. The XM fits an entire mood ceiling. The illuminated headlining is a 3D prism structure with 100 LED lights, and you can change the color to match drive modes or, well, your mood. The seats, which are pretty similar to that that you get in M3 and M4, look fantastic and are really quite comfortable and supportive. The merino leather is supple and perforated and you also get illuminated XM logos in the headrests. And another neat little trick of the XM is that the cup holders are both cooled and heated. Of course, the BMW gets motoring's dog and pony trick of the moment, which is dual digital screens in a large display. BMW does favor a curved screen these days, and it is a little bit unusual to look at because it orients towards the driver, and it does make it look like it tilts a bit to the left. The driver's screen is a pretty conventional 12.3 inch unit, but the multimedia screen is a whopping 14.9 inches. There's also a full color head-up display as standard, so the driver has even more things to look at. The air vent adjustment is finicky and just looks a bit ad hoc. And the luxurious effect that the two-tone leather tries to conspire is ruined a little bit by the incessant use of carbon fibre. And the classic looking wheel makes for a familiar centre point, although carbon fibre has crept into the paddle shifters. 
and you do get plenty of physical buttons on the steering wheel, the center stack, and the center console, so that you're not always accessing system feature adjustment through the touchscreen. Right, let's check out the second row. BMW calls a second row M Lounge, and the quality of the accommodation here certainly makes a very strong case for it. There's a ton of room in here, particularly knee room and headroom, and a really light ambience, but the real highlight for me is this second row bench. It's a one-piece bench, so effectively it's a couch, and in the outboard areas it's really nice and sculpted, but the cool bit is, is that it does extend down through the door trims. You get the same diamond stitched merino leather trim and the lovely vintage leather inserts like you do in the dashboard. And for an added touch of opulence, you also get these fairly nifty Alcantara trim pillows for your lower back. BMW has really pulled no punches when it comes to appointments back here, so you get little hidden USB-C ports in the back of the seats, four zone climate control, an extra two USB-C ports in the back of the console and a 12 volt outlet, and absolutely huge door bins that have some fetching blue mood lighting. Standard Fitment 2 is a 1500 watt Bowers and Wilkins sound system that even includes four speakers up in the ceiling. Right, let's check out the boot. Boot space is a fairly modest 527 liters, which is pretty small for an SUV this size. And that's before you take into account the bag that you get with all your charging cables. It does have quite a high floor, and that's because the XM does need to package its plug-in hybrid architecture and a fairly sophisticated all-wheel drive system. That's two areas we're gonna concentrate on next because we're gonna take it for a drive. I've driven plenty of BMW M cars over the years, and I have a particular soft spot for the old E46 M3. Now the XM doesn't really drive anything like the old M3 or really any other M car of recent times. That's because it drives like two M3s. Why? Because at 2,710 kilograms, it's about the same weight as two old M3 CSLs. Now it's zero to 100 km an hour claim is 4.3 seconds and on the road by the seat of the pants, it does feel about on the money. So what fire and brimstone is summoned to create such pace in such a hefty vehicle? Part of that is a 4.4 litre twin turbo V8, which is good for 360 kilowatts and 650 newton metres. Now BMW has a rich tradition with bi-turbo V8s and those outputs suggest that this engine isn't really giving as much as it could do. And the engine is paired to a conventional eight-speed auto and an all-wheel drive system with rear bias. So, so far so conventional in BMW M land. The XM fits one electric motor upstream and integrated into the eight-speed transmission, which is a different method than what rivals AMG are doing with a GLC 63 by putting one electric motor on the rear axle. However, a so-called pre-gearing stage increases the effective torque to around 450 newton meters. What this means technically is a bit of a mystery, although the suggestion is, is that if the torque was measured at the crank, it would give around 450 newton meters worth of energy. Of course, you don't combine the engine and motor figures to create a total. The total system output for this plug-in hybrid is 480 kilowatts and 800 newton meters. The motor is powered by a 25.7 usable kilowatt hour lithium ion battery and it's nestled in the underbody of the modular CLAR architecture. That's not a new BMW M development, and in fact, BMW has been using that in the current 7 Series, and other vehicles use it as well, such as Toyota Supra. The system does allow you to trickle charge the battery under brake regeneration, but really, if you want to get the maximum benefit of performance and efficiency, you really have to plug this car in. The AC charge maximum is 7.4 kilowatts, and a zero to 100% charge is said to take around four and a half hours. Once fully charged, it's claimed that the XM can drive purely on electric power only for up to 88 kilometers WLTP. Electric consumption, well, the official stats are 29 to 30 kilowatt hours. It'll also cruise in EV only mode at up to 140 kilometers an hour, which is plenty of top speed for us Aussies and the open road. Though the jury is out as to how higher speeds will impact EV range. Fuel consumption, well, BMW is claiming just 2.7 liters per 100, and it might just do that if you do feel so inclined to pull over every 100 kilometers an hour and plug it in again for another four and a half hours. Right now though, in mixed hybrid mode and pretty much a depleted battery, the car is telling us that it's consuming 10.7 liters. 
which is considerably more than the 2.7. Suspension is double wishbone front and a five link rear. And it does fit M Adaptive Suspension Standard, which is steel sprung, but with adaptive dampers. It also fits a 48 volt active anti-roll bar system to keep all of that 2.7 tons of inertia in check when you're chucking it through a corner. Rounding out the dynamic package is active rear steering and an M Sport differential, which is standard on all Aussie versions. Of course, there are different suites of drive modes from Comfort through the Sports Plus, and you can hit the setup button and dig through a myriad of different adjustments to tailor make settings to your liking. And you can assign those to M1 and M2 buttons on the steering wheel. And the all-wheel drive system also has a four-wheel drive sand mode if you're feeling particularly adventurous of putting your 2.7 ton SUV with 23 inch tires on a beach. There's also a separate suite of operating systems where you can toggle between hybrid and electric drive modes or an e-control mode which basically forces the petrol motor into recharging the battery on the move. This powertrain is probably at its best when it's in hybrid mode and the petrol engine is weighing into the drive. The throttle response is nice and even and there's plenty of punch and linearity. That said, the V8 doesn't really have that much rich character or the kind of character that you would expect from such a high performance vehicle. Another thing that you do notice too is there is a pronounced difference in the Sonics when it does decide to swap into pure EV mode or back to V8. You do tend to harness internal combustion on the open road and EV mode when you do get around town and that's where the chinks do tend to come into the XM armour. There's plenty of effortless thrust from the EV motor, however, the throttle response is terribly sharp and you do need to be quite concentrated in your right foot movement, particularly in stop-start traffic because it can tend to just lunge forward quite suddenly. Of course, the quiet nature of the EV drive does really suit this vehicle's comfort leanings, but the same can't really be said for ride quality. While the XM is quite settled at speed, when you do slow down or get to urban speeds, the ride does get very fizzy and very jolty. And the sense is, is the BMW M hasn't really calibrated the comfort mode to be quite soft enough. It's a little bit too noisy for its luxury leanings and spend a fair bit of seat time in here and that noise does get a bit fatiguing. The steering too in either comfort or sport mode is really quite fluid and there's good feel to the brakes, which can be adjusted through two different settings. And when it does kick into EV mode, whether it's around town or on a highway, forward progress is quite crisp and effortless. It doesn't feel quite as big as the X7 upper large SUV, but overall though, by the seat of the pants, it doesn't really sell itself as a very sporting high performance M car. And it still has this ever present hard edge that sort of robs it from being a properly bona fide luxury vehicle. So that was a lot to unpack for what is a lot of Luxo performance motoring that does want for pretty handsome coin. But the XM has only just landed in Australia and we're keen to test some of those performance and efficiency claims a little more closely when we do get the XM through the Chasing Cars garage. For now, the XM is the biggest and baddest M car on Australian roads, but not for long. In the coming months before year's end, the hotter label red version will join the XM in local showrooms. Pricing will start from 345 grand and it fits a hotter tune of the V8 engine, which lifts total system outputs to 550 kilowatts and 1000 Newton meters. And that will create its own landmark as the most powerful M car ever created. If you do believe that more is more, then the XM will be a fine evolution of the M-Car breed. However, it's not the sportiest M-Car that money can buy, and its sporty intentions does come at a compromise of comfort. It offers big performance and big luxury, but I'm inclined to think that it hasn't quite got the balance right yet. But if you like things a little bit more traditional leaner like I do, you might prefer the new M2 Coupe, which is also about to be released on the Australian market. And while some of the XM's excess mightn't be to my taste, I do think that some areas such as the interior are really inspired. And I do think that the XM fits a bit better as an all-rounder Luxo Cruiser than it does as an absolute weapon head kicker. Although for my money, it only really makes sense if you're diligent about plugging it in to get that benefit of performance and efficiency. So that's what I think, but how about you? Put your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe while you're at it. And as always, thanks for watching Chasing Cars.